Welcome to the Your Courageous Life podcast, where we discuss psychology and tools to help you create better habits, cultivate discipline, and live with courage, aka grit and emotional resilience. I'm your host, Kate Swoboda. Learn more about my books and get additional resources at yourcourageouslife.com. And now, here's today's episode. Hey, hey, everybody. I'm coming to you today from a clean desk. If any of you are with me on that, you know how it goes. The stuff is everywhere. I'm totally that person. I know all the neat freaks in the audience are like, what are you talking about? I am not that person. But if you know, you know. But I cleaned off my desk. I'm feeling good. All right, um, before I get into today's episode, a quick note for those of you who might have been interested in the Create What You Crave workshop that I'm holding in California in February. I just realized that I had a tech issue on the back end of things that prevented some of you from registering. Thank you to those of you who let me know. If you fall into that category, send an email over to support at yourcourageouslife.com so that I can get you registered. This is an in-person workshop Definitely highly personal to me because the tools that I'm sharing in that workshop are tools that I've utilized to really turn around a difficult period in my own mental health within the past few years. And create what you crave is not a plan what you want for your life down to the minute kind of a workshop. We got to leave a lot of room for pivots and unfolding into ever more discovery of a deeper desire for what you're really wanting, but rather a realigning to get clear on what you want and how to create some action steps to move towards that in 2024. So again, just send me over an email if anything came up when you were trying to register and encountered a technological issue. Sorry about that. All right, so today's episode is about the psychological connection between physical exercise and mental health and really looking at how you can improve your mental health through exercise. I'm going to give you some insight into the research connections between physical exercise and mental health and in particular I'll be focusing on ways to get started with and stick with physical exercise even if you've been unsuccessful in the past and it will be beneficial even if you are saying to yourself, um, my mental health is fine, but I would still love to learn how to get really regular with the exercise habit. Um, I will be helping you with that today. So this topic of how to use exercise to improve mental health, there's, there's a reason I'm starting here. It is really hitting home for me because, you know, speaking of turning around a difficult period in my own life with mental health, In a previous podcast episode, I shared with all of you that I had stepped away from basically everything for kind of almost two years. I mean, I deleted social media accounts. I definitely deleted the apps. I mean, I was not writing. I was not, I was just not doing any of the things. And that came with a walloping dose of extremely difficult mental health challenges, anxiety, depression. So any of you have followed me long enough know that part of my story was that most of my life until my mid-20s, I would say that I was actively struggling with depression and then I started using the tools that I learned and now teach to others. My life radically turned around. So none of that time period of my life was bullshit. All of that was real. This is not the story of the person online who was like hiding some deep, dark secret the whole time, which... Speaking personally, I always wonder about that when an online influencer who's been saying that this, that, or the other is like the thing that's the best thing. And then it turns out they're like, actually, that whole time I was just like under the crushing weight of pretending and and all of that. I have a lot of empathy for that experience. But part of the reason I stepped back personally is because I did not feel right about continuing to coach, to teach, to work with people when I knew that I was struggling so much and I felt a sense of I need to put on my own um, oxygen mask first. It feels really good to be back. It feels really good to be opening up again for working with coaching clients and, you know, create what you crave, which is upcoming. There's a lot of really, really good things that are going on. 
But talking about improving mental health through exercise is the focus for today because it was has been such a pivotal part of how I stayed afloat just generally in my life and then built more resilience to come back. When I initially stepped back from everything that I was doing, I really thought that it was just going to be a few months. And then that turned into a year. <laughs> And it was within those first few months that several different life challenges all hit at once. And at least how the experience seemed at the time to me, it felt like my mental health just very suddenly plummeted. I was anxious a lot. Um, It wasn't the typical I'm afraid of something type of anxiety so much as it was a lot of worrying and trying to think through decisions and feeling worried that I wasn't arriving at the right answer. I was irritable a lot. Um, I was isolating a lot. I just wanted to be left alone. I wanted to isolate from my husband, from my daughter. It was like I could never get enough alone time. And to be honest, when that came up, at first I thought that the the desire to isolate was just more pandemic stuff. This was late 2021, the pandemic wasn't, it was like kind of starting to go away, but it wasn't over, over. Um, And I I just thought, you know, maybe I had a lot of extra time with my family. I know I'm an introvert anyway, all of that. Now, in hindsight, I go, no, 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 that was, that was another one of the signs that my mental health was just really struggling. And it was actually after I stepped away from being online that This is the great irony, right? Because I know we've all seen the person online who's like, I stepped away from social media and my life is so amazing now. Um, I think maybe a part of me thought that I would be that person, (laughs) which I can laugh about now. But it was actually after I stepped away, like really stepped away, that suddenly the depression and the sadness hit. And then once that hit, it was just really hard to get out of. I would do all the things. I would identify that voice of an internalized critic saying these not great things. I'd reframe thoughts. I had a lot of positive habits in my life already, such as daily meditation. I did not drop any of those positive habits. I'd try to give myself something to look forward to, a new book or a latte, you know, like little things here and there. I actually, for an entire year, Um, When things started to get really rough for an entire year, 365 entire days, I kid you not, I started my day with using the four questions from Byron Katie with the turnarounds around every difficult thought that I was encountering. All of those things helped, but ultimately nothing was budging what I was feeling in a big way with the one exception that I can absolutely point to being exercise. So that's that's kind of why I'm so interested in doing an episode on this. Now, before I go any further, if you are someone struggling with mental health, if you suspect you are struggling, if you are being treated by a practitioner, you should not change a protocol or treatment plan based on this podcast without talking to your doctor. And additionally, if you think you're struggling with mental health and you are not being treated for it, This podcast episode, my books, my writing, everything I produce, none of that should be treated as a substitute for actually getting treatment from a qualified professional who can evaluate you, your situation, what the best course of treatment might be. And sometimes I do want to say that in my writing or when podcasting, I speak in the second person, but that's purely conversational. You are the expert on yourself and what you need. I'm not saying do what I do. I'm presenting ideas for your consideration and evaluation. So this episode is going to contain a few different parts. First, I'll share with you what I noticed in my own experience and how physical exercise improved my own mental health. Second, I'll share with you some of the research behind this connection. And third, regardless of whether or not you want to exercise more to boost your mental health or if you just are like, I would love to get more consistent, I'll talk about some things that you can do to put more physical exercise and movement into your day and really stick with it. And in particular, I'm coming from what's called a biopsychosocial model to do that. So first, I'll jump in with my own experience. Um, Longtime listeners know that I've been a runner. I dabbled in training for Ironman triathlons, 
And in 2018, I discovered CrossFit, which is essentially high intensity interval training or HIIT, H-I-I-T, you might see it sometimes, with some weightlifting thrown in. So back in the days when I was training as a runner and a triathlete, with both of those being cardio intensive activities, I could do them, I could do the work, but those activities I found demanded a lot of recovery time and then I'd find myself more resistant to doing them. Now, there's a whole other thing I could get into about how I think I didn't approach those activities in quite the right way to set myself up for success, and I see that in hindsight, but let's just skip to when I found CrossFit, the thing I immediately loved about it was that I was clearly, it was very obvious, getting fitter and faster and stronger and more resilient, but it did not take as much time as training for a triathlon, and I was recovering so much faster. And that might surprise you because I know all the stereotypes about CrossFit. I know what you've heard. So, (laughs) um, but yes, I was recovering so much faster. I had read a book by author Gretchen Reynolds called The First 20 Minutes that presents the research from exercise physiology that we get the most benefits from exercise in the first 20 minutes. So if I apply that data to CrossFit, to me, it makes sense. Most CrossFit classes are scheduled for an entire hour, but the actual workout time during that hour is like 20 minutes. You usually spend like 20 or so minutes warming up. Sometimes there's a little bit of like a a slow, chill weightlifting, but nothing too intensive. And then 20 or so minutes actually doing the workout, some time for the cool down, things like that. It varies by day, but that's the general trend. So if you consider that the research shows that we get the most benefit from exercise in the first 20 minutes, then it makes sense that CrossFit would make me stronger and faster and, side note, give me muscle definition like I'd never had before and I'd never changed my diet or anything, but without requiring that recovery time of training for road races or triathlons. So if you have been a runner and you love running, but you're like, feels like running's kind of (laughs) hard always. Um, It it could be worth looking into something else. I'm going to talk a little bit about this as we go, especially about when when the working out feels hard. But, you know, basically CrossFit has this reputation of being all hulked out and crazy, but I swear the workouts, they're really just variations of push-ups, pull-ups, squats, and unless someone just goes in there full send without having a good base behind them, I personally have not seen people get injured. It's it's just like anything else. Respect your limits. Don't try to lift or do more than you can actually do or in ways that you haven't actually trained for. So back to the time that I was away from an online presence, writing, speaking, running workshops, training, etc. I never stopped CrossFit during that time. I stopped going to an actual CrossFit gym because of the pandemic, but my husband and I have some plates and barbells and dumbbells and just would work out in our garage and follow workouts that are online. And here's what I would notice. I could be having the saddest day ever where I genuinely believed that day that I was a bad person, that my life wasn't working. Maybe I'm bursting into tears for no reason, like knocking something off of a counter or, you know, something like that. But I made myself do that workout. And when I get into the data, I'm hoping you'll see why. I would have days where I was so resistant to exercise, just dragging my heels, just don't wanna, you know, those days, we all know those days. But I would force myself to do that workout because without exception, afterwards, I always felt like an inch better. Just an inch some days, <laughs> but an inch. Other days more than an inch. Maybe I'd feel sad again later. Maybe I'd feel sad again the next day. But without exception, exercising always left me feeling better than not exercising. Now, here's my take on resistance. And I think that this is regardless of whether you're struggling with mental health or not. When you make a decision to do something that's good for you and you override your resistance, that is something to be proud of. 
And I think that not only does exercising make people feel better because it has all of these great biological benefits like getting your blood moving and improved mitochondria and regulation of blood sugar, but I think there's something mental about exercising as well. There's something about knowing that your resistance, your sadness, whatever you're struggling with, tried to get the best of you and make you not do this thing that's so good for your brain and body, but you did it anyway. You won that day. You didn't give up just because it was hard or because you didn't feel like it. I also think that when you exercise regularly, it creates a regular habit for you to turn to. If you have ever felt really lost, sad, struggling before, you know that having a big gap or hole of time in your day where you have nothing in particular to do, no one that you're talking to, etc., cetera, it, what, what does that result in? Probably for most people, turning to your phone. And the data on spending excessive time on devices is clear. It absolutely makes you more anxious and more depressed to get onto your phone. So having open, unscheduled time while struggling with mental health and then turning to social media or just scrolling for hours, it's only going to compound the issue. Exercise gets you off of the devices. It directs your attention off of your problems And it produces a change in your physical state that, for me, always resulted in at least some shift in my mental state. So let's talk about the research a little bit. I don't want to get too technical. If you do want to get technical into any kind of research about the human experience, I love and recommend the Huberman Lab podcast. Huberman, H-U-B-E-R-M-A-N. But I do like to go a bit beyond just saying exercise is good for you and into a reminder as to why and to how effective the data shows it to be. And for all the data, head over to PubMed. This is a website from the National Institutes of Health. You can run some searches there and filter for results that will give you access to full free articles that have been published in journals showing research in I mean, just every domain. I nerd out on the psychology, but there's there's something for everybody over there. So um, head on over there if you're interested. This is completely for free, PubMed, National Institute of Health. So you can find a lot of information there if you want to check out any of this on your own. So a first resource, if you want to get into the biology of exercise and its benefits, um, there, there's a lot out there. But I'm going to direct you to a paper called Working Out, The Molecular Biology of Exercise by Joel C. Eisenberg. This was published in the Journal of the Missouri State Medical Association called Missouri Medicine. And it gets into the nitty gritty of the beneficial properties of exercise at that biological level, the molecular biological level, in fact. Um, I also found articles when looking through the data on this. Because, and I think the data is important. We're always hearing like exercise is important. It's good for your mental health. We read that in like the little pop psychology kind of skimming the article type of thing. But, but really and truly looking at the research, I think is a fantastic thing to do. And also just something I enormously enjoy. Um, I found articles that show that exercise is beneficial for mental health when offered as an intervention for different age groups. You're probably going to find a lot out there of a kind of general adult pop- adult population showing a positive connection between exercise and reducing symptoms of depression or anxiety. But I wanted to look at different age groups. Um, I found a study titled Impact of Physical Exercise on Depression and Anxiety in Adolescent Inpatients, a Randomized Controlled Trial. And that was um, in the Journal of Affective Disorders by Filippo et al., P-H-I-L-L-I-P-O-T. And in that study, exercise was added as a support for inpatient adolescents who were also receiving therapy treatment. And it was shown to help reduce depressive symptoms. So I bring up that data point, not only because it applies to a population just beyond the adult population, but also because I think it's really interesting to consider exercise as part of an overall toolbox, 
So if you are struggling with mental health or if you just want to live a better life in general, it's not about finding a silver bullet. It's about, okay, what are the things that there, it's like there's a a constellation of data points that when plotted, (laughs) produce an image, produce the constellation, so to speak. I also looked at a meta-analysis. A meta-analysis is when researchers take a number of different studies on a subject that have already been conducted and look at the results of those studies and see if they can find patterns or arrive at a conclusion based on the data across all those studies. One study I found, um, it was in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Um, It's titled Association Between Physical Activity and Risk of Depression, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis by Pierce at all all means and others, P-E-A-R-C-E. This one showed that even those adults who only undertook half of the recommended amount of physical exercise had improvement in their experience of depression. So think about that for a minute. You might, you may or may not know this, but The Surgeon General and the various, you know, physicians and and medical bodies in the United States actually do have a protocol, prescriptives, you could say, for a recommended amount of physical activity every week. That's 150 minutes a week, or really, let's let's just say 30 minutes a day, five days a week. But that meta-analysis that I just mentioned showed that doing even half that amount of exercise could have an effect. So I'm talking about 30 days, 30 minutes a day, five days a week to meet the the recommendation, but it's worth asking ourselves, particularly if you're struggling, could you, could you do 15 minutes? Could 15 minutes of a day of exercise be a mitigating factor? 20 minutes a day, every day be a mitigating factor. So I'm sharing the research behind this because when people are struggling with their mental health, or even if they're struggling with just basic resistance to doing something. I've seen that knowing the data can be really helpful in some cases for motivating yourself to do the thing that you're resisting. I think it's helpful when we're struggling to remind ourselves, look, like like I know what I need to do here. I know what I need to do here because that's one of those loops we can get stuck in sometimes when we're feeling the challenges. We can go, we can tell, well, I don't know what to do. Yeah, you do. You know what you need to do here. The data's clear. This isn't going to get better if I refuse to take action. So I'll at the very least take the action that the data shows can be beneficial. And speaking on a personal note, Another reason that I think exercise in particular can have such a positive effect is that the change in your state when you exercise is so immediate. I mean, there's very little you can say that about in life, right? You you might be struggling with financial problems, marital problems, conflict with a friend, and you're not going to solve that in a half an hour, more than likely. But you certainly can feel better from a half an hour of exercise very, very quickly. Now, now that I've shared some of the research into why exercise is so good for you, how it has so many positive effects, I'd like to get into how to create it as a habit, as I promised earlier, and really tapping into a biopsychosocial model. So biopsychosocial is a way of looking at the biology of a person, the psychology of a person, and the social environment, and all of those being understood as being overlapping, that they can affect one another, and that you can pull them apart, but the field of psychology really has shifted to encompass all three of those areas because it's just so clear that this human experience that each of us are having you can't pull them apart. I can't sit here right now and and pr- produce today's podcast without there being some element of my biology <laughs> because that's my biochemistry and that's my ability to sit in this chair right now and to speak and to have enough um, energy from my my caloric intake today that was properly converted to glucose so that my brain can do what it needs to do to speak, to put together ideas. That is biology. And 
Psychology is another aspect of why I'm even showing up here today. My individual psychology says something about me showing up. My social identification and, of course, all of you here participating today and the society that I live in that taught me that it is okay for me to be a woman and to have a career and to put my own voice out there. All of these things are coming together just for me to speak right now. I think that pulling or on all of the biopsychosocial levers is a great way to support yourself around creating habits, such as habits to improve your mental health through exercise. If you want to get into um, more on habit formation and particularly how you can apply habit formation to your life in a way that is not just about, I need to remember to, I don't know, floss or something like that. Um, head to my website, check out my book, The Courage Habit. It's also on Amazon. And it's all about how you can actually create habits that make you more courageous and more resilient. And I still use all of those tools all the time and credit those tools with why I didn't fall any farther when I was really struggling around uh, mental health for a while. So far today, what I've really been focusing on is the biology the ways that exercise benefits our biology. Quite simply, when we exercise, assuming that we do it within a range that works for us and for our abilities and our tolerance, we feel better. Our biological system feels better. And if you're hearing this and you think, not me, I think it sucks. I got to tell you, that is trainable. It's trainable. Exercise does not suck if you train yourself to tolerate it. And that does mean starting slow, pacing yourself, building up stamina over time. You're not going to cut corners with that. So if you feel like exercise just sucks and that's why you resist it, so then you skip working out and then you're really just digging yourself into that same hole over and over and over. There will be a period where it feels kind of hard. You will overcome that period if you just stick with it. And in the meantime, you get the benefits, which is fantastic. Now, if we take biopsychosocial and we now move from bio to psycho or psychology, if we go into psychology, I think that one way to stick with any form of exercise is to know what you're drawn to, what interests you. And I realize that that might sound really obvious, but I've met a lot of people who they don't try things, but they're convinced they won't like them. And you can do that if you want, but I am very much about try a lot of things. And I'm also like, once you find that thing that that you're drawn to, go for it. Um, I don't know that I would have tried CrossFit except because of its reputation um, for being all hulked out and crazy, um, except that it just kind of happened that way. And now in hindsight, I go, oh. Well, the reason I love it so much is because it appeals to my particular psychological makeup. Um, One, has an element of playfulness to it. Um, In a workout, maybe you're swinging off a pull-up bar one minute and then jumping onto a box another minute. And I'm drawn to the playfulness. I'm drawn to the results. I like results. I'm very results-driven. The loud music. Like it's, I like having this, which is funny because I'm an introvert. I love to read and write and kind of be alone with my thoughts and all of that. But I really love this kind of period of my day with the gangster rap or the metal or whatever playlist I have going. It's just really loud. It feels very cathartic. And also I feel really badass when I lift weights. Um, additionally, I am the type of person who is lit up by a big, hairy, audacious goal. I, tiny progressive goals have never been as interesting to me. So that's some of my psychological makeup and that might not be you and that's fine. Maybe you're drawn to, I don't know, water. Maybe you're just that person. You're like, I just, I have to live near the ocean. I don't know. Maybe the idea for you is swim laps a few times a week solo. Or find a master swim class. They exist. You, you can do a bunch of di- swimming drills with community people, chat, probably go get pizza afterwards or something like that. Maybe you think you hate running because you've only ever done it on roads. But if you tried trail running, you would just absolutely fall in love with it. By the way, I've met so many runners for whom that is true. They thought they hated running and they went on a trail run with a friend, fell in love with it. 
So I don't know, of course, what your individual psychology asks for. All I know is that you have to try a lot of things to find the thing. If you haven't found it already. I mean, in my lifetime, I've played volleyball. I've played basketball. I've been hiking. I tried some classes at that franchise Curves. I've done like just a gym membership and gone to the weight machines. I've tried hiring a trainer to keep myself accountable. And at the time, I think I was trying all of those things because I wanted to meet people or I had this idea that I wanted to quote unquote get in shape. It might have been a body composition goal I had at that time. And it's all different reasons, but, but nonetheless, I had to try a lot of things and no one is more surprised than me, except perhaps my husband, that CrossFit became a thing. Now I pretty much divide my time between CrossFit, running, and weightlifting. So all that other stuff I tried, I had to try all the things to find the thing. And once I found the thing, it's, you know, figure out what you're drawn to. Find a way to do that. Last, let's look at the social end of the biopsychosocial model. So we've talked about bio, we've talked about psycho, now we're getting into social. And with talking about the social aspect of things, your mind is probably naturally going to like a group fitness class. And there are benefits to group fitness, and that does tie into social. But I'll share that one thing I really like about CrossFit is that while you work out with others in the general area, your workout is your own. It's not a group sport where you have to coordinate with others. So the social piece is in there. I do like that other people are around, that I get to know people. You know, you say hi, you chit chat. If you're going to a gym, you know, with my husband, it's time for us. We do it together. Um, time for us to just like do a thing together. But there's another social piece. It's not just about other people. I think there's a social piece that I look at where, you know, we construct our identities to some degree based on the society we live in. For example, part of the reason I define myself as an introvert is based on this society that I live in, where like naturally I'm comparing myself to others who are more gregarious, who like to be around other people for more hours of the day. And so my definition of introversion necessarily has some relationship socially to the social environment I'm in related to other people. If I was alone on an island, which come to think of it could be my definition of heaven, but I'm, I'm not quite that introverted, I guess. I do very much love my husband and hanging out with him and my daughter and all that, but Anyway, or let me go with a different example. If everyone in the world needed exactly the same amount of alone time daily as I do, then I might define introversion differently. We define ourselves to some degree relative to the social environments we're in. When people struggle with their mental health, sometimes they also over-identify with the label. The I'm depressed or the I'm struggling with anxiety takes up a lot of mental energy. And for some people, and I'd say I fall into this category, might resist getting help because they don't want the label. And speaking for myself, I'm a hell of a lot more things. And my life is richer and more contextual than the crappy couple of years that I struggled through. So when you start exercising regularly, There's something of an identity that you take with you by virtue of doing that thing that's part of the social environment you're in. I mean, think about it. I'm a marathoner. I'm a triathlete. I'm a CrossFit CrossFit athlete. I'm a backpacker. It's a way of thinking of yourself. And I think that that has some positive benefits, especially if you are struggling with mental health. You, you, when you're exercising regular, regularly, you aren't just quote unquote depressed. You're also a multifaceted individual who has other identified activities in their life. And you can is- achieve this same shift in identity through things like volunteering or through your work too. But because exercise also comes with so many other positive benefits, because it can create such a profound shift in your state, And because I personally experienced it to be something that, like I said, just without exception would help in some small way every single time. 
it's now my go-to for a bad day. I think of it like even if it's a hard workout or a workout where I really feel like I struggled, you know, those days where it's like, you're just like, this should not feel this hard. You know, um, I know that no matter what, no matter how hard it was, I did it and I'll be better off for having done it, even if nothing else in my life feels like it's working. And I'm really grateful that when I was having such a hard time, I stuck in there with exercise uh, because I really do believe that it was a foundational aspect of surviving a difficult period in my life as well as something that helped me build my way out of that difficult period. So if you're feeling like you too want to get regular about an exercise program, consistent, regular, doing it, you know, more often than not, these are the action steps that I hope you will take away. Um, First, figure out what exercise you're drawn to and try things until you figure it out. Um, I have met people who are really into, for instance, ultimate Frisbee. I didn't even know that this was a thing. I've met people who are really into roller derby. All right. Like, what are you drawn to? Did you watch that that movie with um, a couple years ago it came out? I'm completely spacing on the name, but it was all about roller du- derby. And the same actor who was in Juno was in that movie. Elliot Page. Yeah. Um, that would be, you know, like, what are you drawn to? And, you know, by drawn to, it can be a lot of things. Maybe you admire a friend. Maybe there's a particular athlete. Maybe there's a certain event in the Olympics that you have never done yourself, but you always are like, wow, that's so cool. And you always, I don't know, make sure you show up to watch that particular event. Try a lot of things, figure out what you're drawn to. Start there. And if you cannot think of anything, make it a long daily walk. Not a little 10 minutes, a long daily walk. Second thing, commit to doing that exercise for at least 15 minutes a day, daily. I'm talking about a commitment. Pause for a second with yourself and really ask yourself, what does it mean to commit to something? Because to me, when I commit to something, I'm saying no take backs. I'm saying I'm not going to negotiate it. I'm not going to water it down. I'm not going to say I'm going to do it and then not do it. If I am committing to something, I'm not trying that's, that's, a, that's a big flag for me if I'm coaching someone and they say, well, yeah, I, I could try. Da, da. It's like, okay, do you want to try it or are you committing to it? Different energy with those two. You have to commit, which means you're deciding you're doing it even if it's raining or even if you don't feel like it. Of course, within the bounds of safety. Like, don't exercise if you have COVID. Don't exercise if, like, Lightning strikes are happening outside your house, right? Stay indoors. But other than those extremes, commit to doing it, which means you are making a decision to do something in the way that you initially are deciding to do it. You're not trying, you're doing it. You're not kind of doing it, you're doing it. You're not doing it halfway. Well, I don't know, I'll just kind of do part of it today because I don't know that I have the... No, you're doing it. Committing is big. And I re- I don't know about the research with committing and mental health, but I got to say, I really do believe there was something life affirming for me about feeling so low and yet deciding and not backing down on that, that I was going to do the exercise that I told myself I'd do and that I had done for years. Third, the daily thing, the commitment to do it daily, I think is an important part of this. And I really mean that. I personally advocate exercising in shorter, less intense bursts daily over longer, more intense exercise sessions that are just a few times a week. And here's why. To Do something daily removes any mental negotiations with yourself about the when and the how of doing it. I'm not going to quote him exactly here, but Jocko Willink was once asked why he exercises daily and, you know, when do you get your rest days? And and don't you think rest days are important? And And he said something to the effect of, life will always give you a rest day. 
What I think he meant by that was that life is going to come up. Whether you, whether you plan it into your week or not, life is going to come up. So when it comes to exercise, you're going to get sick and have to take some days off. Or your kid is going to need an unexpected pickup from school when you had planned to go to the gym. Or you're going to decide, I work out every morning, and you're going to set the alarm on your watch, and your watch battery will die and not wake you up, and you'll miss your workout, even though you had 100% every intention of doing it. Life is very good at throwing us curveballs. That's life. It's just going to happen. So with the exception of the scenarios I described, like times where I've had a cold or something out of my control came up, for myself at this point, I exercise daily. Every single day. Yes, every single day. And if I feel like I'm a little run down, I back off. So I'm instead of going for a run, I might go for a long walk, things like that. But I, it's it's daily at this point. And that brings me to a final point that I think creates more successful habits around exercise. Um, it works really, really well for me because I've been super consistent for... Gosh, let's see, it was 2015 when I got super serious, so a while now. It's 2023, almost 2024. Um, Yeah, so back to that, sorry, just suddenly got lost in the years. Sometimes I feel as if I am mentally and emotionally frozen at the year 2015. Everything seemed to like just change a lot, it, starting with 2016. And yes, I'm talking about the election you think I'm talking about. But anyway, coming back to this this final point around creating more successful habits around exercise, you know, once you've committed to doing it, once you've said, okay, I'll do it daily, I recommend making it happen at the same time each day. And this is anecdotal. And I don't know if there's research to back this up. I haven't found any. But I've actually found that I crave exercise daily at about the time that I do it. It's a weird feeling. So for years now, I've exercised at approximately 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And I literally will start craving exercise at around 4 o'clock in the afternoon. There have been a few times, for instance, where I'm traveling and need to catch a flight. So I can't exercise at that time. And I'll start feeling that low-key, anticipatory, mildly antsy feeling, like there's something I need to be doing or getting ready for. I I guess it's a kind of feeling like, you know how you got to get your kids out of the house at about the same time every day, or you got to get yourself to work around the same time every day, and there's something kind of in the background of your mind that starts going, oh, what do I need to be doing to, to get ready for that? That, that's what I feel. Now, there is research that has looked into whether it's more effective to exercise at particular times a day, and I'm pretty sure that the findings skew towards there being somewhat more benefit to exercise in the morning. I've met a lot of people who really like exercise first thing in the morning. They talk about how nothing else can get, can be an interruption. It's really quiet, all of that stuff. I've tried working out in the morning. It, It is not my jam. I am a slow, quiet, meditative morning person, and exercise feels too jarring for me in the morning. Also, though, I do want to point out that the the data points to some extra benefits to exercise in the morning, depending on which study you look at, but the data doesn't say that exercise is bad for you later in the day. Exercise at any time is always better than exercise at no time. So... Again, coming back to those action steps. First, figure out what you want to do. Make it something you're drawn to and try things until you figure it out, okay? Second, commit to doing it. Commit to doing it. Commit, commit, commit. It's not a try. It's not a maybe. It's not a I'll give it a shot. It's I'm committing. And third, committing to doing it daily I think is important. And then my recommendation is making it the same time each day. I just, I I feel like in addition to the anecdotal piece I'm sharing about how I started to kind of crave it at a certain time of day, I can't help but think that if you just arrange your life that it's like, this is the time of day that I do this thing, you just can get into a flow more easily. So 
It's my hope that as I'm winding down this episode and you're thinking about these ways that you can personally benefit from making exercise a more regular part of your life, that you'll think beyond just physical benefits and also really look at what are the profound mental health benefits as well. And they, they tie into that biopsychosocial model or they can. Starting in the new year, I have something coming up and you're invited. Um, you're invited to participate in a 30-day challenge that supports any exercise habits you're trying to cultivate as well as any others. I have a book, 100% Fully Alive. You can find it on Amazon. You can find it on my website, 100% Fully Alive. This book is about how to come back from burnout. And for sure, if you feel like you're in burnout, it can be beneficial. If you feel like you're on the precipice of burnout and you don't want to go into full-on burnout, grab it. Um, But 100% Fully Alive is about how to come back from burnout and create the biopsychosocial habits that make you more resilient. Because I don't think anyone wants to be in what I think a lot of people get stuck in, which is a cycle of, I feel burned out, so I completely and totally, you know, just like burn out and I'm struggling. And by the way, my whole thing was, was not burnout. Um, just in case anyone's wondering. And then as soon as they come back to their lives, it's like, oh, there's the burnout that, you know, kind of sitting right there to come back to. I think a lot of people get into that kind of a zone where it's like they are running on fumes for a really long time. So they essentially take a vacation from their lives and then they come back and really nothing's changed. 100% fully alive is about how do I create the things that make me more resilient so that I'm actually mitigating against burnout to some degree. I think of this book as the book that helps you get your life together and finally do the things you know you need to be doing. So starting in the new year, I will be sharing prompts and expanding on excerpts from that book to encourage people to get consistent. I think we all know that we can do something once It's doing something consistently where we get the most benefit. So if you want to join in, make sure you follow me on Instagram. Username is Kate Courageous. Make sure you head over to my website and are signed up for my newsletter. And by the way, about the newsletters, if you sign up for my newsletter, I am not going to send you 50 bajillion follow-up emails, not even when I'm holding a workshop or some other event with a registration deadline. That drives me nuts. I'm, I'm not a send you three emails a day kind of person. And when you sign up for the newsletter, I give you access to a library of free resources. So head on over to yourcourageouslife.com forward slash begin to get started. So I hope that this was helpful for you today. Biggest uh, way to get going with this that I can recommend right now would be whatever you are doing right here, right now, make the mental commitment to figuring out what you can do and can do consistently and knowing that making that mental commitment, you are saying, I'm not trying, I'm not kind of doing it, I'm doing this no matter what. Um, That is the first place that I would really recommend that you start. So whether you already know what it is you'll gravitate to or whether you've just decided that's it, it's time, I'm going to figure this out, I'm going to find out what I could do and really love doing. I wish you the best as you are going through the initial curiosity and exploration of figuring out what you might love. And I have full trust that you actually will also find that thing that you love and that it will change your life in some really positive and beautiful ways. All right, that's today's episode of the Your Courageous Life podcast. Thank you for listening. To dive in deeper and continue the work, head on over to yourcourageouslife.com. See you there.